Imagine investing $365 million into a project only to receive three years later, $6,500 a month in revenue. Now, a company that's valued at $1.2 billion market cap earning $6,500 per month, there's more things that don't make sense than that. But obviously, you know, when you consider the fact of the matter is that for a protocol that has had so much money that's built out such a massive network, why is there little to no actual utilization of the network? So to speak on this a little bit, I brought on Liron, who caused a little bit of Twitter drama over the past 24 hours between himself and Helium with a post that's garnered over 16,000 likes and multiple retweets discussing the fact of the matter that the company Helium is not generating the revenue that makes sense based on his valuation. So with that, smash up the like, subscribe if you are already. And as you know, and this is huge. Hey, yeah. Uh, so my name is Liron Chapira. I'm at Liron on Twitter. Um, so my background is in computer science and entrepreneurship. Uh, I studied computer science and actually with a focus on cryptography at UC Berkeley um, in the early 2000s. And then when Bitcoin came out, I was kind of ready to appreciate it and, you know, what Satoshi's innovation was with the blockchain. Um, and I was actually an early fan of Bitcoin. Uh, I was buying Bitcoin back in uh, 2011 and I actually invested in Coinbase's seed round uh, back in 2012. So. I've had some very successful crypto investments, which is kind of funny for a crypto skeptic. Sure. Uh, at the same time, I have a background in entrepreneurship. I studied, uh, started my first company right out of college. It was called Quixie, and it got a lot of momentum um, building search engine technology for the app stores of the time. Um, Alibaba was actually one of our customers. They had an app store in China, and they made a huge strategic investment in our company. We ended up raising a total of $170 million over multiple rounds. Uh, I was with the company for six years, uh, and the outcome of all that was, unfortunately, we ended up essentially lighting the money on fire. Um, the, the app store ended up not working out, and we had nothing to show for the investment. So in retrospect, it's um, you know a, a pretty inexcusable failure to burn that much money with nothing to show for it. Right. Sure, sure. But I do know what it's like to be on the inside of the Titanic, right? As so many problems are happening, and yet there's so much hype around it, and so many you know investors are pouring money in, and yet it's just not going to work out. So I kind of have the firsthand experience of what that feels like, which is applicable to looking at the crypto space today. Sure. sure. Yeah. And then just just to finish the story, so afterwards I started another company called Relationship Hero, uh, which is still going today, and it's uh, it's actually profitable and growing. So I like to think I learned some lessons from the past. Sure. And the reason I'm, and the reason I'm now so interested in crypto skepticism, besides the fact that I, I used to be you know a fan of Bitcoin, um, the reason I'm so interested is because it dovetails with a lot of the angel investing that I'm doing, where I notice if a lot of these companies have ideas that don't make any sense even before crypto. And when I started analyzing crypto, I'm like, wow, this is like the worst startup ideas, right? All rolled into an entire trillion dollar ecosystem um, of, of something that doesn't make any sense. And so I have this term called hollow abstraction that I've been using about crypto where everybody's throwing around these abstractions and there's no substance, there's no use case underlying them. And yesterday, Liron put out a tweet that said this, Helium, often cited as one of the best examples of a Web3 use case, has received $365 million of investment led by Andresine Horowitz. Regular folks have also been convinced to spend $250 million buying hotspot nodes in hopes of earning passive income. The result, Helium's total revenue is $6,500 per month. Now, two very brief things. One, the Helium team had an official response by Amir Hakim, the founder of the protocol. One of the things he highlights, which I would like to address, is the fact that he mentions that Helium team only gets 1.5 million tokens, as you can see in this tweet here. But what's interesting is if you take a look at HIP20, which you can see now, it shows that, in fact, in year three, the Helium team or the founders get 33% of the Helium tokens distributed during that year. The amount of tokens being distributed this year is 30 million HNT tokens, which would equate to a simple math of 9.9 .9 million HNT. So if the Helium team says they're only getting 1.5 million of those tokens, where do the rest of those tokens go? The 8.4 million. 
Now, while that's obviously uh, a rather large question, probably has a reasonable response, goes to the venture capitalist. But what is unreasonable is the fact that a multi-billion dollar company generates only $6,500 per month. Liron, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, you you kind of mentioned the headline that $6,500 a month in data usage revenue compared to that uh, $1.1 billion token market cap and compared to that $350 million of investment. I think that's why my tweet resonated. You know, as we speak, it's up to 16,000 likes on Twitter. Yeah. Um, people see those two numbers, 6.5 thousand a month versus $350 million raised. And they, and they say, you know, how does this make any sense? Sure. It only makes sense in the case of a very, very early stage startup right, which you can argue like, okay, you know, give, give it another year, give it another two years. But if it's such an early stage startup, you then have to ask the question, why are the founder rewards? Why are the stakeholder tokens skimming $100 million a year out of the system compared to $6,500 a month of revenue, right? So everybody can see that something smells very fishy, something has gone wrong. Helium is not going according to whatever plan was pitched. Now there's something else that smells a little fishy here. It's the fact that, well, Helium has now removed the total data credit earnings off of its Explorer page. Ironically, coinciding with something like this coming to light a year ago, you would see that. Well, quite frankly, you would see that the network would generate anywhere between two to three million dollars per month in data credits. Well, that statistic is no longer on the Explorer page. Coincidence? Maybe. But what's even more interesting is Liron's perspective on the future of 5G, because Helium has built out a massive IoT network, but with the pivot of 51, their main focus is now 5G. Liron, what are your thoughts on this whole pivot? Okay, yeah, so you know, you, you, you made a couple different points. So I wanna go back to the first one where you're saying, if you go to the Explorer, right, uh, Helium Explorer, there's a key piece of data that they used to be showing that they're now hiding, which I can't believe how shady this is. Right. If you were to go last year and check on the Helium Explorer website, which they put out, you could see the data usage on the network, which is critical. Yeah. It's the number one most critical piece of data is, hey, we're building this LoRaWAN network. How many bits are customers paying for? Mm -hmm. That's what we call a key metric, right, okay. in startups. And you used to be able to see that key metric on the dashboard and they hid the key metric. Why are they hiding the number one key metric? Mm -hmm. It's because they're being shady. It's such an embarrassing stat, which is why, you know, the, the first time it was ever revealed to the public was on my Twitter, quite frankly, which I actually, so technically not on my Twitter, it was in an article called The Generalist uh, yep, yep. that I read right before I tweeted it. So it wasn't my scoop, it was given privately to The Generalist and kind of buried in there, right? Amid like a 7,000 word story, they buried in that little detail. Sure. I saw that detail, I'm like, you're burying the lead. You wrote this big flattering story and you took this damning detail that's buried in the article, that's hidden from the dashboard, and this is the headline. The $6,500 is the headline because when you go to all these people who have purchased these miners, right, over $250 million spent by ordinary folks just trying to make some asset, uh, passive income purchasing these miners, and then they see, right, the, suddenly they see the headline, hey, I'm sorry, but the whole system that you've invested in that you're helping mine, that you're helping be a hotspot, the whole system, the entire customer base of the system is $6,500 a month. Right. At that point, the wake-up call, that's when the victim of the Ponzi realizes like, uh-oh, Right. You don't you want to delay the time when the victim realizes what's going on. Right. Um, and so that was that line. And I know you want to ask about 5G, but I just think there, there's so much dirt and shadiness on the lower one debacle, um, sure. both on the side of VCs and, uh, you know, Helium and Nova, the company that um, I don't know, maybe we can you know keep digging into that a little bit more. And many of us like the idea of decentralization because it gives power back to the people, something that's quite honestly nearly non-existent anymore. And that's why so many of us fell in love with the concept of Helium's network, especially their once actual slogan, the People's Network, now the Venture Capitalist Network. But what's interesting is considering the perspective of a decentralized approach to IoT, now a decentralized approach to 5G, how will Helium fare in this endeavor? Does decentralization make sense with blockchain technology for the IoT and 5G space? Uh, the concept is not valid, I'm afraid. Um, so there's actually a few points that I, I don't think people realize. Um, so number one, you don't need a blockchain. So the purported reason why you need a blockchain is because 
Uh, it's decentralized, so if you're going to run decentralized nodes, you want decentralized accounting of you know who is using whose bandwidth. Um, that's false from a technical perspective. Uh, it would be very easy to set up a central server where every time there's a bandwidth transfer, the parties involved report you know a digitally signed uh, uh, record of the transaction reported up to a central server. The central server just records who's given bandwidth to who. Um, you know, I can explain in more detail, but the point is like there is such a thing as a distributed internet protocol with accounting done by a, a central server. Like that's not a problem. And when you insist on running it on a blockchain, what happens is you get more overhead, which then goes back to making the, the network less competitive. Um, now, you know, that's a solvable problem, but the, my real point isn't that it's like hopeless to do with a blockchain. It's that it's pointless. And the only reason you do it with a blockchain is to tell a story to venture capitalists and to miners, right? So when your goal is to sell a miner that is explicitly overpriced, right? Like a $500 miner that costs $100 to manufacture, um, when that's your goal, then the story that it's the people's network and it's implemented by blockchain is a perfect story for your goal, but it's not a perfect story technology-wise. And I have one more point to explain why it's not a perfect story technology-wise, which is the internet itself without blockchain um, is a decentralized network. I mean, if you look at the origin of the word internet, right? It's a network of networks. There is no central middle node to the internet. So anybody can join on the internet. In fact, you know, famously in the 60s and 70s, the internet, it started in the military as a network that could survive a nuclear attack. Because right. you take out part of the network, it can route around it, right? It's packet switched routing. And Anybody can be an ISP serving their neighborhood. Anybody can be a new internet backbone. So you take this decentralized in internet architecture that's already peer to peer. And if you want to build the people's network, what you do is you have what's, what's called an ISP in a box. So I'm actually familiar with a startup that did Y Combinator right after I did, and that's what they do. They, they make it really easy to start an ISP and bring more internet connectivity to people. That's a totally valid approach, has nothing to do with blockchain. Sure. The funny thing is that the Helium approach is explicitly to sell your Wi-Fi to your neighbors via LoRaWAN, which funny enough is, you know, it's violating of the terms of service of your own ISP. Um, and it's just, it, it's, a, it's against the spirit of just building the internet itself. Um, so it's, it's, it's really just an incoherent label and the blockchain piece makes no sense at all. A couple of weeks ago, I burned a helium hotspot or at least majority of it because to show an embolism of the fact that the IOT portion of the helium network is quote unquote dead. And in fact, the focus almost entirely is now on the 5G space. Maybe we know why now because of only $6,500 a month generated revenue. Maybe venture capitalists weren't too happy about that. Either way, I've been promoting this message quite often, saying that quite honestly, for most people, it is not worth mining helium and you shouldn't buy a helium hotspot. And for very few people, there could be a perfect scenario where you could earn some H&T but those scenarios were few and far between. So what should you do if one of your hotspots is one of the two million that's currently on order? I would say run, <clears throat> run as fast as you can and, and don't be the next sucker because there's so much evidence that you've been taken advantage of. Um, so number one is, you know, the fact that they're already starting on 5G when there's no evidence of success of the Loro one strategy and they're already pivoting to the net, you know, very much like a Luna one, Luna two situation. Uh, and, and the other reason is this scheme was explicitly designed to benefit the first people to get miners, the first people to get in. This is how Ponzi schemes work. You, you want to recruit more miners. You want to hype this up. You want to get more funding. And whoever was holding tokens first, whoever bought the first miner, all these prices were really high because they were being subsidized. You get more tokens for mining when the network is growing faster. So they're like, oh, let's pour so much money in this network. Let's grow it really fast. And everybody's like, wow, so many tokens are coming in. There's so much bandwidth. There was wasn't so much bandwidth. The end user demand, the number they were hiding about how much real customers wanted to purchase data usage, that number was, you know, less than $6,000 a month, right? It was a tiny, tiny number. And they were hiding that and they were replacing it with another number that was maintenance traffic, right? Traffic from other miners. So if you've ever done Herbalife, if you've ever done Amway, right? And, and they send you, they make you buy, right? The Amway kit, they charge you. Yep. And they, they have you recruit other people into the system. And the whole focus of an Amway or an Herbalife, a multi-level marketing scheme, the whole focus is let's build the network. Let's build your pyramid. And there's no focus to like, hey, wait a minute, you know, how many people out there want to buy Herbalife products like to use, right? The leaves of the pyramid. There's not that many leaves. It's mostly just if you're in the pyramid, you're actually the one that they're siphoning money out of. They're siphoning money out of you when you're buying that miner. They're siphoning money out of you when they're buying that H&T token. 
So what are your thoughts on Helium? Is it a Ponzi scheme, MLM, or just an opportunity for the early birds to actually get the worm and the rest of those who are not early enough to the opportunity to be exit liquidity? I personally have my opinion. You have heard Liron's, but hopefully this gives you a different perspective than oftentimes you may see on YouTube and obviously a different perspective from more of a formal view of the network rather than the passive income side of opportunity. Because personally, there's passive income opportunities within Helium for the early ones. That was the case for the early opportunity within Helium where people were making several thousand dollars a month. And the same case for those who were early to 5G. Passive income, insane amount of opportunity for the early birds. But too bad, too sad, if you're late, you are the bait.